to page 3360. I want to find out from management if the amount of um, 1,857 Ghana cities has been retrieved um, from two workers who separated from your um, institution. Honorable Chair, management has retrieved the said amount, and yesterday we were able to pay into the consolidated fund. At the time we were submitting our response, the payment had not been effected, so we could not attach the receipt. But I have the receipt here uh, with us that we can tender. Thank you. Yes, sir. Did they pay with interest? Did they accrue any interest? No, Honorable. They did not pay with interest. Do you demand it or not? There had been an earlier letter written to these staff, and these are staff, one of them re retired and the other resigned, and they were they continue to receive salary for some additional months after they have retired, and so when we invited them, they came round and. They struggled to even make this refund. So we did not charge interest on the amount. Since 2012. Um, quick question. If it, was, if it was your company, would you allow that? Honorable, it depends on the circumstance. It depends on the circumstance. If the money was fraudulently taken, I would have charged interest. But who allowed this? Who allowed the payments to go through? The issue is quite complicated because if you look at the, uh, the one who retired, when he retired, the office notified the controller and accountant general. But we don't know what happened and he was able to receive salaries for some additional months. Looking at uh, table 141, income statement for 2014, I mean, there's every reason to commend you for some efficiency that might have led to a tremendous increase in your IGF. It moved from 1.6 in 2013 to 5.2, which is, in percentage terms, 218%. First of all, I want to find out, what did you do differently in 2014 that resulted in this tremendous performance? Thank you, Honorable. We tried to enforce regulation. So the practitioners and the people we regulate are supposed to pay some fees. These fees are paid annually. But the question is, when should the stakeholder decide to pay the fee? Because if the stakeholder decides to pay the fee in December, he has paid. But should that be accepted? And so we instituted penalties so that if you don't pay by March, end of March, the amount start attracting penalty. And that contributed greatly in, in the revenues that we, we got. And also, we also expanded on our rule. There were some activities that either two were not strongly worked on. And as we improve on our rule, all these activities rake in revenue. And that reflects in what we are saying. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I, I believe that um, the capping will not be a disincentive in working very hard to ensure that you continue to increase your IDF. But would you say that 
Um, the tremendous performance is the reason for which when some staff decide to resign, you refuse and uh, continue to pay them. Because we told of one, Madame Marianne Todjagbo. He left on steady leave, indeed returned. When he returned, she then did, chose not to stay with us any longer and wrote to resign. Under the terms of the bond, she was to pay back all emoluments and salaries that we had paid while she was, she was on steady leave. So in her, you just read that we, chose, we did not accept her resignation. The reason being that before you resign as a senior staff, under our conditions of service, first of all, you give three months' notice. Then under the terms of the bond, you are supposed to pay all salaries and emoluments that were paid you while you were on three years steady leave. This she did not do. And we, so we did that. That was the basis for which we did not accept her resignation. So, if I may finish. So, we took steps to recover our money. Discussions did not help matters much, so we had to resort to the court to recover the money. If you go to the, our response to the invitation granted us, we have indicated we far we supported our response with a writ and their statement of defense as well. So we are, the matter is before the law courts for which we hope. At the end of the day, when the court determines the matter, we can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how long have you been pursuing her? And if she's in current employment elsewhere, have you taken any steps to inform her current employers? That is in court. Okay. How's, how long has it been going on? Because this, we're talking of 2013. Before we issued a court action, we were at a stage of dialoguing to recover the money. We went to the court in 2016. When you go to the villages, you see that we have uh, licensed chemical sellers, we have pharmacists or pharmacies there. But we realize that the people who are there are not trained pharmacists. What goes into the kind of license you give them to operate pharmacies in those places? Thank you, Honorable. When you visit a pharmacy, the pharmacy must have a pharmacist as mandated by the law. But the pharmacist technically cannot work alone. And so the pharmacist work with other support staff. The law permits us to train support staff, and indeed we have pharmacy support staff who are ranked from pharmacy technicians and the next category is medicine counter assistants. These people are trained to uh, perform the role that uh, they play. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, uh, that is why I centered my question more in the villages. Because in the cities, at least, you can see the pharmacists, or occasionally you see him around, and then his subordinates are there. But in the villages, you see that the person who owns the pharmacy himself is not even a pharmacist, right? And uh, you know, unfortunately, in the villages, the first point of call is actually not the doctor or the hospital, but the first point of call is the pharmacy or the drugstore. 
how or the chemical seller, whatever name that we use as would be appropriate, how sure are we, especially those of us from the village, how sure are we that we are dealing with the person who really knows the job and that he is indeed trained? And how sure are you yourselves? Very sure. To begin with, uh, Mr. Chair, the reason is that before, usually in the villages or the rural settings, we usually have what we used to call licensed chemical sellers. Now, by your very good selves, we call them over the counter medicine sellers. Before you acquire a license, we take you through an examination process. You go through an examination and interview for us to be certain that you are capable of delivering the service in those settings. Then again, once we license you, year on, we give you every year, we give you training to bring you up to speed with the service type that we expect the chemical sellers, which we, who is now the over the counter medicine seller, to deliver. We will go around to conduct inspections. And those who are found short of what is expected of them, we have sanctions and other regulatory measures that we are able to exercise over them. So in the totality of all these things, it, we are sure that we are not exposed now rural settings to any harm or danger. Uh, uh, this will be directed at the head of Liga. Now, if we look at your response, um, let's look at the rates. Your rates, you, you have sued Marianne Honu as well as the other two defendants who are her guarantors in the circumstances. Now, if you look at the, the defense that has been filed, you will see that it was a defense filed only on behalf of the first plaintiff. So, uh, sorry, a first defendant, and that the two defendants in the matter have not, I have seen no evidence of even entry of appearance or, or defense thereafter. Now, if they have refused to defend the matter, and yet they are the guarantors, what steps have you taken to proceed against them? Um, for judgment in lieu of in lieu of appearance or of defence in the matter, they are parties. They are first and second, in fact, second and third defendants. Yes, who are the guarantors for the first uh, defendant in the matter? Exactly my question. Thank you very much, honourable member. Before you answer, let me... Yes, it's, it's, it's legal, but it's factual as well. Before you answer, you will see that your, yes, your prayer, your release before the court is, is joint and severally. So that is why I'm asking this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. As at the time the writ was issued, Pharmacy Council had no legal department. So we contacted a private, if you look at the, the rate itself, a private firm to conduct this case for us. Ordinarily, we should have gone for judgment in default of appearance. But we, uh, that was not done. I consulted the, uh, the lawyer in this matter. He intimated to me that the second and third defendants could not be saved. That being the case, one would have expected that we should have gone by substitution. Yeah, that is what I mean by substitution service. We should have gone by that route. Unfortunately, that too, from my understanding from the lawyer in question, that was not 
He is yet to do that. So that is where we are. Paragraph 1422 on page 337. The auditors are mentioning different names here. Madame Marianne Tojagbo. But in your, uh, the, the read, the, the real person is Marianne Honu, who is the first defendant. Who is the person actually? What is the name of the one involved here? Thank you very much. In our response, we have indicated that Madame, the name is a bit difficult for me to mention, Tojagbo, then was not a missus. She became a missus, and therefore is now missus Marian Honu. So it's one and the same person. It's, it's clear now. Thank you. I want us to get back to page 335, the financial position, and then to look at the asset component that is making your liquidity ratio very huge. And I'm more concerned about the last sentence of uh, para 1413. That you explain that the current which asset of the, is which of the paras? 1413. Is it, it paracetamol or parachuting? Paragraph. Para <laughs> Complete para it. Paragraph 1413 of page 335. Talking about the assets. And the last sentence of that paragraph, which reads, this was mainly due to increase in bank balances during the year on the review. Bank balances during the year on the review. Why did you choose to keep a huge balance, a huge cash balance, either cash on hand or cash at bank? Why did you do that? Because there could have been an alternative prudent financial use of such holdings. Thank you, Honorable. Around that time, I think we were scheduled to do some procurement, and there were challenges in the processes. So the processes were halted, so we couldn't procure to the extent that we planned to procure. And that has been happening to us uh, annually, virtually. And so that also explains the, the, the bank balances. Will you agree with me that for prudent financial management, such huge balances could have been invested in a way, awaiting disbursement? Honorable, that would require permission from uh, our supervisor, which is the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance. I beg to disagree. Once you are the controller at the, at the business entity and you have the funds which can be invested to earn some additional incomes, I think it would have been very prudent, very proactive to do that. And then from the follow-up, what measures are you taking now to make sure you don't hold on to huge cash balances, either at the bank or cash on hand? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to explain that Pharmacy Council is a government entity, and by law, we are to have that bank balance you see there is in the Bank of Ghana we are not allowed by law to invest this money into any uh, you rather say no mischief. Mr. Chairman, um, every entity that has appeared before this committee, which means that it has been audited by the Auditor General, they have the problem, I will call it a challenge now, of an end salary running through almost all of them. I want to find out from Pharmacy Council, you have that infraction attributed to you. What mechanics or what strategies have you put in place to avert this situation in 
your entity going forward? Honorable Chair, with your permission, I would ask the Chief Accountant to answer this. Thank you very much. Uh, as I read from the reports, and uh, with the current salary structure as we have in the government service, the controller and the accountant general pay salary of workers. And when somebody is separated from the organization, inputs have to be made to delete that person's name from the payment voucher. But we have what we have uh, called the PPS, that's the Personnel Processing Unit for every organization. It is not just simple taking the, the person's name from the voucher from the pharmacy council. So ideally what will be done is to make the necessary inputs for deletion from the payroll of government and uh, also write to the, the, the employees' bankers to stop the salary, which is paid after the person has uh, separated. But in most cases, what I've realized is that either the bank has not stopped, I've not cited any letter to the bank in that respect. But I've been told that the inputs have been made. And it passes through the process which is not, which does not even go to uh, controller and counter general directly. Because the Ministry of Health has a personal processing unit. So any input made from pharmacy council will have to pass through the Ministry of Health personnel processing unit, which is sent electronically to the controller and the counter And that route is a bit long, and that may explain why this uh, uh, delay in deleting the salaries. Thank you. Fortunately for us, there were two cases in 2014. And from your response, you have recovered fully the, the amount involved. Is that right? My issue is that uh, when the first person, Mr. Jacob Tewia, retired on the, in June 2013, he took salary for three months before the auditors came and discovered that this man took an end salary for three months after 14 months of retirement. How, yeah. So if there was no audit, you, you, this wouldn't have come to your attention. I may have I've gone for it. He took three months salary after retirement. Fourteen months thereafter, when the auditors came, then they discovered that that, that was the case. Uh, as uh, I already said, I came to read this. Uh, but last year, when the auditors came, I, I took the file. I noticed that he was written to earlier. And even last year, we also wrote to him to come and make good this uh, payment. So no, no, I'm not talking about the payment. Yes. Your response said that uh, Mr. Jacob and Tewia, yes. and then uh, Comfort Kok Ruku. Yes. Kokroko yes. have all the <laughs> have Kokroko 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 have all paid. What I want from your response, you did not tell us when they paid. You only told us that they have cleared all the outstanding, but you didn't tell us when. So we want to know from 2013, when was the last uh, payment made? Both. Uh, uh, Tewia and then Kokroko, Comfort. Uh, my colleague already said that they paid yesterday. And, uh, Mr. Chairman. They actually paid yesterday. Before, because you, you, you knew you were coming here today, you put pressure and pressure and pressure to get them settled yesterday. Yes. Uh, my reading of the files 
indicator they've been written to, they were called and so. In the case of Mr. Teria, for instance, uh, if I may, I may. Okay. He retired and uh, paid the conditions of service of pharmacy cancer. He was to be given some. Uh, no, the point I just want you to yeah, make is that yeah. uh, uh, you have now told this uh, committee that uh, yeah. he paid only yesterday. Yes. The two, the two of them. Yes. Because you are appearing here, do I take it? Yes. Because you, uh, the, uh, the council is coming, uh, appearing before the park today. That's why you. Actually, the... when the invitation came on Friday, uh, one of the sentences of the invitation that we should come with the evidence the, the the people cited. So we gave them letter and called them, and. Uh, in spite of the fact that previously they were adamant to cooperate, this letter prompted them to come. So that is uh, the explanation. I have another one, but it's also